Welcome back to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. This is Father Peter Mangum. Our Catholic faith itself teaches us to seek unity among all Christians. Jesus Christ established one church by his own authority and empowered the apostles to continue his work on earth in his name. Christ's will is unity, that they may be one. So we can say that our disunities come from our own will, not his will. We fervently pray for Christian unity. I will introduce two more extraordinarily beautiful prayers straight from the Roman Missal from Masses dedicated to Christian unity with this and next week's final episode. This is Episode 9, The Renewal of Mysticism. All of the podcasts in this series have explored various aspects of the Protestant movement and the issues it brought to light from our examination of what constitutes the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, doctrine versus practice, and what represents true reform. This week, we turn our attention to examining some of the beneficial effects of the Protestant movement. Yes, that's right. How are Catholics helped by Protestantism? In the wake of the Council of Trent, which was the topic of Episode 7, the Church enjoyed a great reaffirmation and renewal. In many ways, the Church emerged from the 16th century more richly defined and enjoying a much stronger identity in the emerging modern world. The Protestant movement focused our attention back to the basics of our faith, to the universal truth we have always professed. And as a result, we found renewed ways to express it in the world. For that, we should give thanks. This was seen in a great renewal of mysticism, meaning to explore that which is hidden. This is a Christian ideal that dates to the earliest church. As contemplation, prayer, and meditation became focused on deeper ways to experience the closeness of Christ. Now, all who have a prayer life have engaged in this to one degree or another, but in this we refer to a systematic and disciplined approach found in the exemplary lives of many of the saints throughout history. For our purposes today, a mystical encounter is one in which a person becomes aware of a direct, profound, and personal experience of God. Some of the more notable mystics of early Christianity include St. Paul, as well as St. Clement and St. Anthony. And from the Middle Ages, Pope St. Gregory the Great comes to mind, as does St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Many of us will perhaps recognize a more contemporary mystic from the 20th century, St. Padre Pio. The pages of church history are full of stories of the lives of these mystics and many others who sought the deepest possible human encounter with the divine, not just as a devotional practice, but as an entire way of life. More than that, this ideal encounter was not only for the individual experience, but was seen as vital for the good of the whole church. For instance, some of the earliest writings of the Church Fathers speak of the themes of conflict and disagreements among Christians and emphasize unity over all else. Sound familiar? The Fathers stressed that in the exercise of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, these charisms, through prophecy and vision in mystical encounters, the Church would always remain one. This became an important part of monastic life in the early Middle Ages, and therefore an ideal that is found repeated often in the stories of many great saints. Generally speaking, Protestants were suspicious of the mysticism of Catholic history. The abuses of practice that Luther and others highlighted were often framed in a context that became confused with mystical experiences of the late Middle Ages. So the long-held ideal of spiritual transcendence in the Christian life was downplayed. Indeed, it might be said that because of this general suspicion that Protestantism introduced into intellectual history, the postmodern world now questions miracles and all things supernatural, anything non-scientific or empirical. 
We've already seen that in its response to Protestantism, the church was actually strengthened, and many ancient practices found new meaning and clarity. One of the resulting great things to occur, therefore, was a renewal of Catholic mysticism, perhaps even a purifying of it. The late 16th and early 17th centuries saw a flowering of the new mystical movements, devotion, and literature seen in the lives of people like St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, both of whom lived in the immediate aftermath of the Protestant Reformation and were therefore profoundly influenced by the counter-strengthening going on in the church. St. Teresa of Avila, was a Carmelite nun whose approach to mysticism centered on what she called the ascent of the soul, which took place in four distinct stages that she described in her writings. What is uniquely compelling about St. Teresa is her practical, detailed instructions for those seeking the deepest possible union with God. From her own experiences, she describes in autobiographical form what has become some of the best-known manuals for others to use. The interior castle remains one of the remarkable examples of post-Reformation mystical literature in the Church, even to this day. A contemporary of St. Teresa's was St. John of the Cross, a Carmelite priest, perhaps best known for his work entitled The Dark Night of the Soul. This work tells the story of the journey of the soul from its physical body to union with God, happening under the cover of night, which St. John uses as a metaphor for the trials of this life. Beyond being beautiful prose, it is a work of literature that continues to inspire and influence all Christians seeking a deeper spiritual experience. The writings of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila were made possible by the environment within the church due to the Protestant Reformation. That's my point. So, in many ways, we Catholics should indeed be grateful for the opportunity given us to reassert, renew, and reclaim the fullness of our deeply spiritual Christian heritage. The mystical tradition enjoys a great lineage back to the Apostles, and was reborn anew in the 16th century. The Catechism of the Catholic Church has much to say about the mystical encounter of God with His Church and exhorts Catholics to an ongoing experience of the great mysteries of faith. With such a perspective, we are able to join with the earliest Christians and those who will come after us. There is perhaps no better illustration of transcending history with the eyes of faith than this one. Join me next week for the final episode of this podcast where we will explore yet another great result of the Catholic Reformation, the zealous defense of the Church by a new order known as the Jesuits, and the resulting explosion of mission and scholarship that has driven the Church into the modern world. But now we pray, using, again, another beautiful text. This one is a second collect. The Church recommends we pray in the second of its collection of Masses for Christian unity. Imagine the powerful force all Christians worldwide in one Church could be to ourselves and the rest of the world. So let us pray. Make known in us, O Lord, the abundance of your mercy And, in the power of your Spirit, remove the divisions between Christians, that your church may appear more clearly as a sign raised high among the nations, and that the world, enlightened by your Spirit, may believe in the Christ whom you have sent, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Until next week, thanks for listening to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. Mortum.